uh, in the 1930s, there was a sympathetic administration for many reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, th that combination of militant labor action, uh, of, it was a very lively political period in many ways. Uh, and uh, a sympathetic administration did lead to the New Deal which greatly changed people's lives. FDR actually put his finger on, 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 on something that other people overlook. And he had a wonderful statement about how with, with the coming of the war, uh, Do Dr. New Deal was replaced by Dr. Win the War. And what that meant is the war put an end to the New Deal. Well, what's the difference from the 1930s? several things. Uh, one thing that's different is uh, large-scale uh, labor action. The 1930s were the period of the organization of the CIO. Labor movement had been virtually destroyed. Remember, we have, this is very much a business-run society. American labor history is very violent, uh, quite unlike uh, comparable countries. And by the 1920s, uh, the, the quite effective militant labor movement had been pretty much crushed. Uh, one of the great works of labor history by uh, David Montgomery, one of the great labor historians, is called uh, The Rise and Fall of the uh, American Labor Movement. Uh, he was talking about the 1920s, when it had essentially been destroyed. The 1930s, it revived. It revived with uh, large-scale uh, organizing activities. Uh, CIO organizing was for, began. Uh, the, the strike actions were quite militant. Uh, they led to sit-down strikes. Uh, they, a sit-down strike uh, is a real sign of warning to the business classes because there's a step beyond a sit-down strike. The next step beyond a sit-down strike is, let's start the factory by our, running by ourselves. We don't need the bosses. We can run it ourselves. So get rid of them, okay? That's a real revolution, the kind that should take place. The participants in an enterprise would own and run it by themselves instead of being the uh, slaves of the private owners who control their lives. And a sit-down strike is a bare step away from that. Uh, that uh, that uh, aroused real fear among the ownership classes. Second element was there was a sympathetic administration, which is very critical. Uh, you look at the history of uh, labor actions over the centuries. Uh, there's a very good book on this, incidentally, by uh, Eric Loomis, who studies, has a book called uh, American History in Ten Strikes, or some similar name. Uh, where he runs through uh, la uh, the militant labor actions ever since the early 19th century. And he makes an interesting point. He says, every successful labor action has had the support, at least tacit support of uh, the government. If the government and the ownership classes are unified in crushing labor action, they've always succeeded. Okay? Very significant observation. Uh, he, uh, in the 1930s, there was a sympathetic administration for many reasons. Uh, but uh, uh, th that combination of militant labor action, uh, of, it was a very lively political period in many ways, uh, and uh, a sympathetic administration did lead to the New Deal, which greatly changed people's lives. The advocates of Obama, uh, Obama's policies, quote, cite Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal as a model, close quote. Why? What is it about the New Deal that permits people to cite it as a model with a straight face eight decades after it was enacted. Because of the widespread belief that it was the New Deal which saved the country and got us out of the Depression. In, in, in the you mean it wasn't? <laughs> uh, in politics, what matters is not what the facts are. What matters is what people believe. 
because people vote on the basis of what they believe and not on the basis of what the facts are. All right. This is, in my judgment, this is critical. This is one of the most important aspects of this marvelous book, The Housing Boom and Bust. You write, Tom, quote, the larger question that remains as relevant as ever, eight decades after the enactment of the New Deal, was it the failure of the free market that led to the massive unemployment which persisted throughout the 1930s, or was the Great Depression prolonged by the government interventions that were intended to shorten it? Close quote. And your analysis is as follows. Well, there are a lot of ways of going at this. One is to look at, look at the sequence of events. And right. we can look at, look, look at the sequence. In October 1929, the stock market crashed. Two months later, uh, unemployment peaked at 9%. Over the next several months, uh, the, the unemployment began to subside irregularly, uh, down to 6.3% by June of 1930. Uh, so... Eight months after the stock market crash, we have not yet hit double digits in unemployment. June 1930, when it's 6.3%, the government intervenes first, uh, the first real intervention on a massive scale under Hoover, the, uh, the Smoot-Hawley tariffs, which were designed to um, uh, reduce unemployment by restricting imports in the United States so that more of these goods will be built in the United States by American workers. It sounds good. A thousand economists from the leading universities around the country signed a public appeal to Congress and the president not to pass this bill, that it would not do what they said it would do. It would not uh, reduce unemployment. Uh, it would, in fact, lead to retaliation that would make it harder for Americans to sell their goods in other countries. As often happens, no one paid the slightest attention. The bill was passed. Uh, and uh, within five months after the bill was passed, we had double-digit unemployment for the first time. This is from a, from a bill designed to lower unemployment. Right. And, when it hit, and this time, it did not subside. It never fell below double digits for the entire remainder of the decade of the 30s, not even for a single month. Uh, not all of it was the smooth hawley tariff. When FDR came in in 33. He then put in the National Industrial Recovery Act. He put in the uh, Agricultural Adjustment Act. He put in the Wagner Act. He issued more presidential uh, executive orders than all subsequent presidents throughout the remainder of the 20th century. So the government intervened on a massive scale, and yet the unemployment never came down below double digits for the entire decade. So we get the stock market crash in 29. <clears throat> Herbert Hoover, as president, understands that something terrible has happened, but fundamentally the policies in place are those of Calvin Coolidge and every president before, small federal government, mm -hmm. and we see signs that the market begins to correct itself. Right. The economy begins to recover, and then Herbert Hoover and Congress decide what to do to fix things. Yes. And they immediately make things worse, and Franklin Roosevelt comes in and keeps fixing it and keeps fixing it and keeps fixing it, and it stays bad, bad, bad. Yes. That's a fair assessment? Yes. Okay. So then we have to move on to the next question, which is, well, then what did end the Great Depression? If it wasn't the New Deal, it's, it's over by the middle of the unemployment is down to uh, oh, close to zero by the middle of the war. Yes. So what happened? The war. The war happened. But the question is, what about the war? Well, yes, right. Go ahead. Well, well, one of the things that the war did that most people seem not, 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 not to uh, notice is that it took 12 million men out of, out of the civilian labor force and put them in uniform. That'll help your unemployment figures. It will, right. yes. Uh, FDR actually put his finger on, 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 on something that other people overlook. And he had a wonderful statement about how with, with the coming of the war, uh, Do Dr. New Deal was replaced by Dr. Win the War. And what that meant is the war put an end to the New Deal. And when you put, and moreover, it went the other direction. Instead of creating all this uncertainty, uh, which, which all this intervention does, quite aside from the merits of the particular interventions, uh, it gave a tremendous certainty because it began the practice of cost plus contracts for military uh, equipment suppliers. And so if you signed a contract with the government for a million dollars, you were guaranteed you'd get your million dollars back plus whatever profit they allowed in the contract. 
So before you see, because of all the anti-business rhetoric, you never. Well, when, once you start intervening, it's not just a question of the merit of the particular intervention. It's the fact that nobody knows when you're going to intervene again, and that's true. True now that you know this whole thing about no one said that you you could fire the, the head of General Motors by by giving them this money. But once they decide they're going to do it, they can do it. And so nobody knows what's going to happen next. 